Hello, everyone. This is Brayden, and thank you for joining me for this third episode of Scoring a Scene, where uh, we've been looking at my submission to Spitfire's Westworld 2020 uh, scoring competition, where I scored a piece of music for the scene. And uh, in this last episode, I'm going to take you through um, some things I did in the mixing and mastering process. And uh, hopefully from this, you can kind of get some ideas of some some tools to take into your own uh, mixes at home, especially if you are someone like me who mixes a lot of your own uh, output as a composer. And uh, yeah, so let's dive right in. As you can see here, I've got my mixing session with all of my um, different instruments that I'm using in the arrangement in video two that we talked about. I export all of those individually and each instrument has a track um, as I, I don't think I mentioned this in the arranging video, but sometimes you have a instrument or sample, especially if it's like a, say it's a collection of loops and it's one, uh, instance of contact, but they have multiple loops within that. And you're, and you're using multiples. I export all those individually as well. So even though they're on one single track, I will, uh, use the la uh, lanes feature in Cubase and uh, not here, but in the in the arranging stage when I'm exporting and I'll uh, export each of those one at a time. You can solo them because I want to have total control over the uh, over the mixing process. Now, I'm not going to go as you can see, I have things color coded as well and I've got things organized. Um, I'm not going to go over to. Um, I'm not going to go over or organization too much in this video. Um, Suffice it to say, you should um, definitely look into uh, tips regarding organizing and structuring your uh, workflow and your uh, arranging session as well as your mixing session. And I do recommend um, doing those separately. Um, uh, I would recommend looking those up and I might make a video about that uh, at some point, but we're not necessarily going to do that today. But I've got everything organized here and just a quick overview i've got my my string instruments uh long and short uh, i typically try to separate those out because i will treat them differently as we will see i've got my brass my orchestral percussion i like to uh, divvy these up between the most of the frequency content so highs mid and low range instruments separate those out Synthesizers are separated into the lead synths and then ones that are more of pads or textures or pagiators. And then I've got my synth percussion down here at the bottom. And finally, uh, bass content. And these are all the different uh, bass instruments I'm using as we talked about in the arrangement. There's quite a few. Uh, so what I thought I would do is just kind of dive right in. We'll start with the, the, the mix bus and the, the master output settings. And then I'll go through the uh, the the group the tracks or or the or the buses where I have um, everything routed to the various instruments and I'm uh, utilizing different uh, mixing techniques and, and plugins and such um, so we can get into those specifically and I've got some uh, some separate buses before they go into these master buses that we will talk about as well okay. Um, so real quick to mention, I want to mention some mastering stuff and, and, uh, limiting. I don't do, I don't do a ton of mastering and I'm really not, um, someone you necessarily want to listen to for like good mastering advice. Um, you know, mastering is a totally different, uh, job than than mixing and although obviously they're utilizing a lot of the same tools um it's a it's a different approach than mixing um and typically i don't mastering is still something that i i don't worry about a ton and i don't use a separate mix session i will kind of as you can see on my stereo out here um I will kind of use this as my mastering chain and I don't, you know, I'm not good enough at mastering and know enough about it to do more than this in a, in a, in a separate session anyway. So I kind of just keep it in this session 
And really what I do is I set my final limiter and maybe I'll do some, some uh, EQ, some mastering EQ. Um, I don't have anything here, as you can see in uh, this instance of uh, FabFilter Pro Q2, which is uh, a fantastic EQ plugin and one that I use a lot. I'm not really doing anything um, because this is mainly just for analysis, for kind of visually looking at the frequency spectrum and, and looking for obvious stuff, like is any frequency sticking out um, over, over others to a degree that I would want to uh, remedy that. But um, sometimes I will do some uh, EQing on the master, um, you know, stereo out, but not doing that here. And I've got uh, Pro L2, another Fab Filter plugin. You're going to see a lot of those here. And I've, you know, basically set my gain. And uh, the Pro Q2 has uh, some cool features where you can. Um, I forget how to. I forget how to show that actually, but I think it just maybe it just pops up. Let's take a listen here, real quick. Something. Oh no, you gotta, you gotta pull that up. Okay. So you can, this is a, this is a lot to get into and I don't want to get into this too much. Um, but you can, uh, monitor in pro L2, um, you can monitor, uh, your loudness and this is a, you know, this is another thing though. You can monitor all these different types of, um, all these different parameters. This is another thing that I'm really not an expert on. So, <laughs> um, and it gives you, if you hover over stuff, it'll give you the, you know, the information to pop up on what exactly all this stuff means, but you can just get really technical with how loud your final print of your music is going to be. Um, I've set this, honestly, this is probably too hot. Um, but you know, that's okay. Still sounds fine. Um, true, true peak limiting is, uh, helpful to have you definitely want to have that if you have a limiter that uh that has that because you definitely want to make sure that it's it's grabbing all the peaks that it can a limiter is just a you know really intense compressor that's making sure things don't exceed beyond a certain threshold and uh and distort and just like definitely cleaning things up and getting rid of any any peaks that would uh possibly you know cause distortion which is not a great sound um, and your output, usually it's recommended not to have it as zero, but at 0 0.01 or 0 0.02. I've got it at 0 0.02 just to be safe um, in case there's anything that it doesn't catch, which, you know, these uh, plugins are getting better and better all the time, but you, you know, want to be careful nonetheless. Okay, let's go ahead and check out the, the mix bus. I'll play you everything without and then with, and then we'll talk about the specific plugins that are on here. Let's see. Without. With. So let's talk about what's going on here. Let's uh, first I've got an EQ. I'm not doing a ton, as you can see. I have a high pass. This could probably be a bit uh, steeper, this uh, slope here. But I've got a, I've got a high pass filter that is filtering out everything below 30 um, hertz, pretty much. And usually it's, you know, usually 30 to 40 hertz is like so low that it's almost impossible to hear, you know, with the human ear. Um, and so filtering out, usually on every mix I do, I've got an EQ with a filter on it high pass and it's cleaning up around 30 to 40 depending on you know how I feel that day I suppose um, but that's a that's something I do on every mix and then I've got around 113k here I'm just cleaning up a little bit negative 2.3 dB just kind of cleaning up this uh, almost getting into the this is still pretty low range not barely into the low mids um, but let's check that out really small change but it's just cleaning up some some of the muddiness there 
Now I've got uh, an instance of this Pro MB, this multiband compressor. Um, however, this isn't actually doing really any compression. What it's actually kind of acting as in this instance is a, so I've set this uh, frequency band here going all the way to 200. So it's affecting only the low frequencies in the, in the, in the music. And I've panned the, uh, the mid side band, which basically is affecting the, all the bass frequencies over the entire song over the entire track. And I'm, and I'm bringing those bass frequencies into mono instead of stereo. And a lot of music, a lot of, uh, a lot of music utilizes this trick and basically this just helps solidify your your uh, the low end the bass end of your track um, into one you know mono signal that's going to you know cut through a lot stronger than it would have if it had some you know stereo qualities to it it's gonna it's gonna bring a little bit more cohesion i used to use the this uh multi-band for this you can actually do this with an eq too and i've started just doing that in my eq that i have anyway in uh most of my tracks uh yeah, but you can do it either way it doesn't really matter and you can hear a little bit of difference without and with you hear how that just tightens up and there was some stuff in the sides there sort of painting around that really like just cinches up and creates a nice foundation for the track. Similar to the low end, I'm also using uh, the Waves R-Bass plugin. Uh, really uh, have only been using this plugin in the last couple months or so, but I love it. Um, and I'm giving the low end at about 42K a little bit of a boost. Um, this thing goes down to negative 24 on the intensity and it's at negative 22. So I'm not hitting this super hard with the R bass. You can crank it up as you can hear and it'll really affect it. And it starts like getting all, all nasty there and distorted. So I definitely don't want that. Um, but I, I like to kind of tap it with this just a little bit to give that bass a little boost and not uh, you you want everything to be to be balanced in a mix that's what we're going for ultimately is balance um in all the frequencies so if this pushes the bass too hot then you'd want to dial that back a little bit or you know kind of take another approach but i found that this kind of got it to a nice balanced place we'll do before and after it just adds a an extra an extra kick to that and okay let's go over these uh some compression here i've got fab filters uh, compressor c2 and i'm not as you can see i've got i've got uh, the attack is is and release are both kind of set at their at their medium stages so not too fast not too slow just kind of just kind of in the middle um Let's see, my ratio is at about three. I've got a sidechain feature activated, so I'm I'm trying not to affect anything below 200 hertz um, too much, because that can really cause uh, the the compression to be a little bit more intense. Didn't want super intense compression here with this guy. Just wanted, as you can see here, we're we're only we're barely getting to negative two dB. So about one to two dB reduction, not a lot more than that. I'm just kind of using this along with this uh, SSL compressor, just hitting it a little bit harder, but still around negative two, maybe negative three. Not even, that's barely a negative one. Um, so barely hitting it. And uh, pretty slow attack and release times here, actually. Um, as far as attack and release times on compressors, I would say, you know, just just play around with it. Just, you know, go from slow to fast to slow again on the attack. Find out what what sounds good in combination with different slow and, and fast settings on the release. 
Um, just, just tune it to taste. There are some, you know, people out there who will tell you, you know, on a, on a such and such track, you know, this instrument or a vocal, you always want to do a fast attack and a, you know, whatever release. Um, but, uh, just, just play around with it. Um, find out what works best for you. These are just adding a little bit of, you know, a uh, final mix bus compression that's kind of hopefully gluing everything together. We'll do without and with. There you go. It feels like it kind of just like comes together ever so slightly. This is uh, this is some subtle stuff, but uh, if you really listen, you can hear it. Okay, uh, let's get into the the master tracks here. So, really quick, I will mention on this mix i utilized a technique that i didn't used to do a lot of before and um it's a it's a tip known as parallel compression and basically what that means is you are utilizing a, a compressor to um often heavily compress a a duplicate version of a bus or an instrument or something to that effect and then you're blending it back in with the original um, and now I was listening to a lot of uh, interviews with mixer Andrew Sheps a while back and he surprised me in saying that he does almost exclusively parallel compression and uh, nothing else and I to my knowledge and most people don't do that and I was really fascinated by that idea and I had liked the way parallel compression had sort of sounded other times where I occasionally used it so I decided this time to use it on everything even though this was this was like the one of the riskiest things that I did in uh, working on the submission for this for this contest I still decided to uh, take an approach to the mix that I had literally never done before that and that is uh, do parallel compression on uh, everything. And so as you can see down here, um, I've got my, you know, strings, brass, synths, percussion, all that stuff. And uh, everything is going to a parallel uh, group track as well, one way or the other. The bass gets its own compression, parallel compression. I'm parallel compressing all of the uh, percussion, the orchestral and synth percussion. And then literally everything else is just going to an all instrument uh, parallel group. And that's getting compressed as well. Um, so I'll kind of go through, you know, settings and 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 stuff of these as I as I go along here. Let's start with percussion, um, real quick. Let's take a look here. Just a slight dip in. Start at about here. We've got a slight dip in. What is that? About four K here on this uh, group. Oh, actually, sorry, let's start. Right about here. So just a little dip there, uh, very subtle stuff, about one and a half dB. It took me many years of, of doing this, of, of mixing, and I'm still learning all the time. I'm still <laughs> trying to get better and better all the time. But it took me a long time before I could make moves this subtle because uh, before you kind of want to just, you know, take the frequency band and jack it up and, um, you know, add a lot of uh, I don't know what the thinking behind that would be. Um, and sometimes it's it's good to sometimes you can make drastic moves like that and it's appropriate, but it's harder to make the subtler moves. And so that is one that, you know, doesn't make a lot of difference. Just a little bit. I, I can't even, I can barely even notice that, but it's doing something. And then I've got my synth percussion as well. I'm not doing a ton here on the master channels, as you can see. The, synth, uh, the string channel in my instrument parallel is getting the most done. But uh, so we'll listen to this with and without this uh, parallel compression here real quick. And let's see how much this is compressing real fast. So this is pretty heavy compression. We're going down to almost about negative 10. Attack and release still uh, kind of in the middle. Apparently that's something I'd like to do a lot. And so this is 
you know, the we have the orchestral percussion, we've got the synth percussion, and then we've got them both, and they're duplicated going into this track, and then we're compressing that and blending it back in with the original, um, and it's adding a little bit more kick, a little bit more emphasis. I'll show you with and without here. Without. With. And you can hear in the entirety of the track, it just, those drums kind of cut through just a little bit more and, and really feel much more solid in the overall mix. I'm doing the same thing with the bass. Um, still using a, I forgot to mention a CLA 76, just like I did on the, on the drums. I often find myself using the, the blacky version instead of the bluey. Um, when I'm, when I have this on something that's uh, mostly low frequency content, like bass and, uh, you know, percussion, obviously there's lots of different, there's higher content as well, but that the, the blacky kind of brings like a low energy to it that I really like. And I'm comp uh, compressing the bass as well in a parallel group. Similarly to about a negative seven. My attack is much faster this time, uh, release a little bit slower. The bass for this track ended up being a pretty dynamic, um, especially for a bass, um, at least, uh, you know, in the, in the tracks that I'm, I'm used to working on. Um, some of these uh, some of these synthesizer tracks were kind of all over the place dynamically. So I'm I'm just uh, and and you want to keep that. It's kind of got a got a cool movement to it. But I'm just reining in part of the bass and and uh, using this for support. I'll show you with and without without first. With it just feels like much more of a full sound. And uh, let's go ahead and. And hear that in context. Hear that just brings the bass in there, and you can hear it actually cut through the rest of those elements, really solidifying the low end. Um, and let's go ahead and take a look here at uh, the the all instruments real quick. Um, I've got everything else, my my synthesizers, my brass, and my strings going into this all channel. Definitely another another tip that wasn't stressed to me enough when I was uh, learning this stuff is try to a common pitfall that uh, new mixers will fall into is they will solo the strings and then try to mix the strings. Um, you want to try not to do that. You want to try to avoid soloing as much as possible and mix in context with the rest of everything around you. Um, there are appropriate times to do it, especially if there's like a pesky frequency that's happening somewhere and you're not sure which instrument it is. Go ahead and solo stuff and try to find it and try to filter that out. Um, but you'll get better results if you, if you mix in context with everything else. Because it's not about how that... If you're, if you're mixing in solo, you're going to get those strings to sound really great by themselves. And then you may find that you unsolo that and in context, uh, what you've done, it may work, it may not. So might as well just mix in context and, and to get a better result more quickly. Anyway, I'm using the pro C2 on, uh, my all instrument parallel. And let's just see here. We're getting about, getting about negative nine, almost negative 10 uh, dB reduction. Um, kind of a faster attack, slower release settings on this guy. And the other thing I'm doing here is I've got a, this is kind of like a, I've retrofitted this, uh, the multiband compressor to just kind of be one single band across the entire frequency spectrum. And what I'm doing is compressing the entirety of the, the parallel instrument group. And I have uh, created a, a side chain here where this is being activated by the, um, by the percussion. And basically, whenever the percussion is coming in, 
this is being brought down. Um, the entire level of this um, all instrument parallel group is going to be brought down and then back up again after the percussion kicks in. This is to, and I'm doing this with the bass as well as we will see later on. Um, it's just with the lower frequency content, not with everything else. This is just because this uh, track is so dense that I'm trying to just reduce this a little bit so as to create more room for the percussion to cut through. If that gets drowned out in a you know, sea of everything else, our heartbeat is gone, the rhythm is gone, the percussion is you know, the foundation of the track. We want to make sure that's getting through. And it's, it's, I'm not even reducing that much. We'll hear it here. You know, barely like one or two dB reduction there. As you can see, only when the percussion is cutting through just a little bit, that's going to help it cut. It's again, that's very subtle stuff. Um, but it's going to make, um, it's going to make quite a difference in the end result. And I'll show you without that and with. There you go. Just, to, you know, and these, uh, I'm not boosting these a ton. I guess the percussion's coming up, a, a, you know, quite a little bit. But these guys are in the negative 20s with everything else kind of around zero or one. Um, so... Not just blending them, blending them into taste. Nothing's overpowering. Everything else is just kind of helping um, balance everything else out. Like I said, it's all about balance. Uh, the strings are getting some EQ here, which I'll show you. Just kind of uh, giving them more of that. Uh, that silky feel taking away of some low mid content here, some of that muddiness. I am usually always uh, reducing some 2K um, around strings. Um, not always, depends on the sample, depends on the sample, and definitely don't take any um, sort of examples of, of mixing here and apply it across the board on every single one of your mixes. I've seen people give terrible advice where they say, if you have, you know, a guitar track or a whatever, you always want to do such and such to it. This is music. There are no rules. There is no like quick fix for everything. However, um, reducing 2K, um, you know, 2000 uh, Hertz on your string tracks is uh, something I do almost every single time and it just helps to balance them out and really give them that kind of silky um, lush feeling much more pleasing to the ear that way even with these uh with these really um prominent short strings that's pretty much the the master buses let's take a look at some of the other um individual buses and then uh, and then we'll wrap up here. So I've got my main orchestral reverb that's going to all my orchestral sounds. Some of the some of the other digital percussion sounds are getting this. Um, it's a patch from uh, uh, Spaces Two from East West. Um, this uh, convolution reverb, and it's got uh, lots of different. Um, lots of different settings and spaces that you can sort of emulate the sound of. Um, I kind of just choose this, this may be, this may even be the default one that kind of pops up, but it's a great, uh, it's a great concert room, um, that I like. I kind of just go through and pick the one that I think is going to work best for the track. So I, you know, sometimes I pick different ones. Sometimes I utilize the same one. Totally depends. I'll show you without and with real quick. Just adding a little space there. That's it by itself. I'm filtering out. I this is something I always do on reverb. You know, um, don't necessarily. It depends on the track. It depends on the track. Um, I want to emphasize that, but I filter out a low pass uh, or a high cut. Yeah, low pass filter. I'm 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 filtering up to 5k, and then uh, two th 200. 
uh, for the high pass. Want to get rid of those the, all the all the air and the really harsh high frequencies and the super low frequencies. Want to get those out so they don't muddy things up and uh, so that these don't make it too harsh or too bright. Want to just kind of control that. I'm doing a similar thing to this other um, reverb, which is a uh, Valhalla Vintage Verb, and it's just kind of, I think it's maybe affecting one instrument or something. It's just adding some space to one of the synthesizer elements. Um, okay, so let's go to the bass bus real quick and just look at everything I'm doing here to the bass content. Let's see here. So firstly, I've got an SSL uh, e-channel strip, and all I'm doing here is I'm cutting to about 45 hertz and I'm I'm compressing just a bit. It's as you can see it's it's occasionally lighting up at around negative three um, gain reduction. Uh, could be even going as high as negative four. Not a super high ratio three. That's pretty you know standard stuff. Um, pretty decent release time. Just trying to glue all those bass sounds together like like we saw in the arrangement and like we can see here I've got a bunch of different sounds some of them going uh you know playing together at once so compressing and reducing some of those dynamics is just going to help glue everything together and uh you know if you're asking yourself why are you filtering out low frequency content when this is bass it's low it's low frequency low frequency instrumentation that's what it's there for um, the percussion is even lower frequency content and you definitely want to leave room for that bass and percussion is one of the, you know, age old, um, tricks and, uh, difficulties in mixing is how to get, you know, the percussion, which is low frequency and the bass, which is low frequency to not fight each other and to not, uh, fight for space and to occupy similar space, but complement each other very well. So and one of the ways you can, um, there are lots of ways you can do that. One of the ways you can do that is just try to filter out some of the bass until you feel like it still has that, that low, um, low enough, you know, glue for the rest of the track that you want. It, it doesn't lose that, that feeling, but it's, it's carving away some space for the percussion to just kind of go, go nuts. Um, Sound Toys Decapitator, I actually got this plugin recently before doing this mix and uh since then i've put it on everything it's a fantastic saturation plugin um which can add some distortion and some other you know frequency content and just kind of color your tracks in uh in interesting ways without and with this is subtle stuff too i am I'm boosting a decent amount and cutting a little more low frequency, but to my ear, it's adding some, some ag just extra emphasis in the bass, um, in the low end. Um, definitely be careful with your outputs when compressing, when doing anything really. Um, you want to try to balance as much as possible because it's really deceptive when you put on a plugin like this and and you crank it up and you go oh that must be you know that must be better because it's um it feels like it's louder well that may be the only reason why you think it's an improvement or that the adjustment you've made is the right one because there's just something naturally about when when things are turned up and when they're slightly louder we go oh that's it's pleasing to the ear it's you can you can hear better i don't know what it is but it doesn't necessarily mean um that it's better and so all you always want to attenuate your output accordingly and have it at exactly the same level as uh before you did the effect or whatever you did that way you can truly judge and uh accurately what you've done and you're and you know you're not just being fooled by it being louder our bass again um on the bass obviously that's a good place to put it and uh, I'm boosting it about 60. Um, I usually do about 40-ish on percussion, and I find that like 50 or 60, again, depends on the track, but is that's usually a good frequency area to boost on the bass and have that, you know, beefed up but not fighting the percussion. And you can hear without and with. It's 
it's giving us a bit more there. And uh, here's that multi-band compression I was talking about. This is uh, being triggered by the, whoops, by the uh, percussion. I don't know what I'm doing. It's being triggered by the percussion and uh, bass is being brought down when the percussion comes in. And then as soon as it goes away, it comes back up. Um, and this is, you know, another trick that's really useful to try to keep, you know, those instruments from fighting each other for a frequency space. Let's see here. Really subtle. You can see there that when the kick drum was coming in, um, and here I'll do a couple more of these. Not even on every single every single one, just the big ones, just the main heartbeat of the of the track is that being brought down. Um, subtle stuff, but that's going to help uh, those uh, instruments get along. In the uh, so I've got some. I'll try to speed through the rest of these here. I've got some all my sub percussion. It's basically this low rhythms and the and these kicks. I've got a decapitator on those, saturating those, adding some low frequency content. I've got some low percussion here that we just looked at. I'm decapitating those um, with various settings, you know, to taste and a bit of high, uh, a bit of a high shelf um, boost there at about three dB, um, just to add some air, pretty much like. And this is most of this is happening beyond 10k, so this is super high. This is that sparkle. This is that that air that's going to get infused into the into the tracks and and give it a little bit more energy adding adding uh more frequency content from like 8k and beyond is a great way to add to energize the track See if we can listen to some of that without with very subtle just kind of coming through a little bit um, let's see, getting rid of some of the, some of the low muddy right here in the middle, um, is where a lot of mud can come from, from, from two to, you know, to around 500, even, even to 700, um, quite a, quite a dip there. This is going to be where a lot of mud comes from without. And with still kind of subtle, but just cleaning that up a little bit. I've got some high frequency stuff that I'm kind of filtering out using a little echo on there. This is pretty much the, the hi hats and some other higher percussion. You know, there's a little bit happening here, not a ton, but I don't need a lot of that. I'm also filtering out dipping at around 5k a little bit getting rid of some harsh frequencies i want these to be silky and smooth and um you know keep the keep the rhythm going i've got some low arpeggiators here which are mostly towards the end so let's take a listen to those it's without everything and then with and you might have been able to tell that um, reducing some of the some of the low frequency stuff, I got a low shelf at around 100, and that's cutting out a lot of that. Something around 180 and 360. Also got a you know high pass filter cutting out some of the some of the low end as well. Just kind of cleaning up. I didn't need these to be. These are kind of naturally lower, bassier arpeggiator sounds. But again, we're, you know, you can think of your mix like a room and the and the frequency is different space in the room. There's only 
so much space in the room and there's only so many instruments you can pile on top of each other before they start fighting for space. You can't put, you know, um, two chairs in the same corner. You can put a, a table and then maybe, maybe a lamp on top of it. And that'll kind of fit, you know, in that, uh, metaphorical space, so to speak, but you try to stack chairs on top of each other. It's going to be kind of a mess. Um, we're kind of a weird, uh, analogy. Hopefully that's helpful though. Because I've got these, you know, low arpeggiator sounds and they're cool, but I've also got percussion and I've got bass there and I don't want to stack too much low frequency stuff on top of each other. So I'm just getting rid of some of that low end. It's all about prioritizing, you know, is it, did it sound bad before? No, but it's not about bad. It's about balanced within the context of everything else. Um, looks like I'm also... What is this doing? I'm compressing a little bit, multiband of the low end, see even more treatment of the low end. And I'm saturating a bit with the uh, Fab Filter Saturn, which is not necessarily my favorite saturation plugin anymore, sorry to say, because uh, Decapitator is um, in my toolbox now, but uh, Saturn is fantastic as well. And it's, uh, and it's multiband, so you can add different bands, and I'm not gonna turn this into a Saturn ad right now, but uh, pretty great. I've got some other arpeggiators and we're taking out this middle frequencies as you can hear before and after. Um, hopefully you can see when I'm deactivating and activating these plugins, but just kind of cleaning up. Didn't really need those. Saturating a little bit here on my, uh, my high arpeggiators. I've got some some textures here that I'm adding a little bit of this Valhalla Supermassive, which I think is completely free. Um, free uh, reverb plugin. Pretty cool. And I'm doing that to... These only happen a couple times throughout the track, but right at the very beginning we have one. And that didn't have this reverb at all really before. It was very dry. And uh, I slapped this on there, just kind of trying stuff out, experimenting, and I thought it uh, was a nice part of the scene to give it that, that reverb tail there and make it more spacey. And it's, you know, pretty long reverb there. Um, okay, let's talk really quickly about this. Uh, as you can see, there's not much left. So almost there. Um, my lead synthesizers, as we've heard previously, are definitely going to be these types of sounds. Um, I'm doing a bit of, uh, as you can see, I did a bunch of other stuff here and then uh, I bypassed all that, got rid of it, didn't need it. Um, realized that it, you know, I kept it for whatever reason, but didn't end up doing that in the long run. I'm just getting rid of some mud here, some of the muddier frequencies around uh, 270, 450. Like I said, that 500, that uh, 500, 200 to 500 range is always um, full of uh, frequency content that you can cut in certain things. So it'll just make the track a lot easier on the ears. <laughs> So there's that. I'm decapitating, saturating. I've got several um, compression plugins here back to back. Um, and like we saw in the mix bus, which is always kind of in my site here um, on the right, um, multiple instances of compression can be helpful. If you're asking yourself, why do you, you already had the one compressor, why are you throwing another one on there? Um, it's a, that's a long, complicated topic to get into, but it's useful to keep in mind that different compressors often have um, different sort of colors to them sometimes. Uh, like uh, the FabFilter uh, compressor, which I have an instance of after the, the, the 2A, is a, is a really clean compressor. It doesn't really like, it just kind of compresses and that's it. But the two-way is going to add some character to it, and you'll you'll see a little change in terms of the color of the sound um, overall. And different uh, compressors will do that, so you may want to do that. You know, if uh, you like the color of a certain, and like the like we saw with the 
CLA 76 earlier, the, you have different options in terms of kind of how those color, how it colors the track, um, the audio of whatever you're compressing. And so you, you want it for that reason. And also it kind of helps to just reinforce what the other compressor was doing if it's doing the same thing, but it's, you know, you don't want to crank the other compressor up so much that it just completely sucks the dynamic life out of the track, which I have definitely done at several different instances. Um, so let's see. And this is barely, you can see here, I'm, I'm barely reducing any dynamics at all. Similar to this one, each one is barely at around negative one dB of gain reduction. And without barely noticeable, but that is kind of just reining in some of the more dynamic um, elements in in the kind of lead synth category. And then I'm boosting at about 120 just to just to add a little bit more weight in the low end. Not too much, but I don't want it to sound, you know, flat. I don't want it to sound like this. You know, we can still have some bass content in there as long as it's not fighting the bass too much. And then I found myself ending up uh, creating a parallel uh, group for my lead synthesizers individually. Um, when I was listening back to the mixing, I was getting close to being completed. But this lead synth just uh, group bus, this wasn't cutting through as much as I would have liked. This is what it sounded like before. It's there, but it's a li it's still a little too thin and faint uh, to my ear, and I wanted that to cut through a little bit more, and turning, up, turning it up wasn't... That was obviously an option. It wasn't necessarily doing it for me, though, so I just created a, uh, a parallel track Put the 2A on there. I love the CLA 2A. Very heavily compressing to about negative seven. And I found that that really just, just brought it up. And, uh, you know, parallel compression is something that happens to vocals a lot of the time. And so sometimes if you think about your lead elements in your track, like your vocal, if you're doing an instru uh, instrumental track without a vocal, I decided to treat the lead synths like a vocal, parallel compress them, blend them in, and you can hear uh, before and after here. You can hear how it just kind of, when you take it out, the energy's kind of gone a little bit, and then when you bring it back, it's, it's right at the front there, and um, really helps overall. Really quickly, we'll go over the uh, kind of orchestral elements a little bit here. I've got some uh, percussion here. My super low stuff. I'm EQing these more than anything else, basically. I'll show you before and after. And you can hear as I take these out one at a time. This this a huge uh, wide band in the in the in the mid range. You know, just some of that some of that boxiness and mud here at around a hundred. Taking out that kind of boomy stuff because I don't need it. I want to you know try to save that for the bass. So cleaning that up, adding some uh, some saturation there, and then some R bass to this as well. Negative 18, so not a ton, a little bit more than we're doing on the mix bus, but uh, not quite as much as we were doing on the bass. Um, and boosting it around 42. That's going to be super low. Almost can barely hear it, but it's just going to add some some weight and some thickness to the drums overall. out. See how much more impact that has after everything. Pat myself on the back here. My mid percussion. Kind of just kind of cleaning that up a little bit. 
a little bit of a high pass, a little bit of a cut in the middle, saturating that a tad with uh, Saturn. And this high percussion is mainly for my cymbals. It's entirely for my cymbals. And I find myself uh, doing this all the time on cymbals, is uh, high passing and then cutting kind of close to 1K and then kind of close to about 3 to 4K. Kind of depends on the cymbal. Um, but you can hear. That just kind of cleans it up, shines it up. Um, as I was uh, reviewing this to go over for this video, I realized I'm not doing anything to brass. I think like anything at all, which is kind of interesting. I, I had totally forgotten that I didn't do anything to brass. Um, sorry if you can hear my neighbor's dog, hopefully not, but I definitely can. Um, I'm cutting, I've got a, you know, high pass filter cutting everything below a hundred Hertz. And that's literally it. Um, of course, the, the brass is going to the parallel uh, compression for, for all the other instruments, but I'm not EQing. I'm not doing anything. Um, and, you know, hopefully this is a good example of just knowing when you don't need to, you don't have to EQ everything. You don't have to compress everything. This is a mistake I used to make a lot when I first started mixing. And I probably still do it more often than I should, but, um, you know, Definitely hear me give this advice that you don't have to mix everything. If there's an element that's just, you know, you balance it with some panning or some uh, volume automation, um, you know, gain stage it well enough and it's balanced in the mix and it sounds good and just don't touch it. Um, don't create problems to fix is a good piece of advice that I've heard um, with regards to mixing before. Don't go looking for problems. Just address the ones you can actually hear and sound problematic to you. Um, now, once you're, when you're starting out, of course, you kind of need to, uh, it's, it's helpful to, you may not know what to look for and that's okay, but brass here. This, this low articulation, it's in there, but it's, it's so low in the mix because I didn't want to prioritize it. It's just there for kind of support. And then the monster brass is just there kind of support the uh, synthesizer sounds, add some more energy. So didn't do anything there because I didn't need to. Um, and then real quick, lastly, I find myself doing this on strings a lot lately anyway. On the short strings, I tend to, I like to EQ all the strings together, obviously. That's um, certainly what you want to what you want to do at first. And then I tend to like going to the short strings and boost a little bit around sometimes eight, eight K in this case, it's around 10 K. So this is going to be super high. And you know, this is that, that sizzle, that air, I'll boost it a lot for you here to, to kind of hear that. That's that super sharp frequency content boosting very subtly at around two db but uh you know you can you can think of the short strings as a kind of hi-hat almost is a piece of advice i've heard um those are that's rhythmic content that's going to cut through and you want to cut through everything else um so that that rhythm doesn't dis disappear in the in the mix And you can hear it. These are still pretty light in here, but uh, let's listen to this section. Without and with. Without. And with it. With. With it. Um, just kind of cutting through a little bit more in the higher range. And then with my, with my long strings, I tend to do the opposite. I tend to reduce, and you can see I'm actually reducing the full reduction kind of starts around 10k, even though my my uh, my shelf kind of starts at 8,500. Um, I tend to reduce um, with a high shelf. Sometimes I do more than this. This is still like this is kind of low for me. <laughs> um, it's kind of tame for me. 
Um, it's almost a negative five, which is a lot. Sometimes I'll go negative six, negative nine. Sometimes it totally depends on the arrangement. I didn't have a ton of lo uh, long strings in here, so that's probably why I didn't need to. Definitely only go as 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 far as your ear tells you is okay to go. Um, you know, don't necessar unnecessarily create any rules for yourself or or say, well, I reduced this much on this last track, so I should probably do the same amount here, you know, go with what the, what the track calls for, but you can, you can hear, I'll play these, these long strings and I'm just kind of, I want my long, I kind of like my long strings to be, um, really lush and silky and I don't want them to be very harsh. And this harsh frequency content is good for some things like our short strings because it'll cut through the mix and solidify that rhythm that those strings are performing. But with the with the high strings, I kind of want the opposite. I want them to be a lot more lush, a little bit tame, and not as harsh. So I'll reduce here, and that sounds like this without. And with, especially when those high octave strings come through, you can hear it gets kind of, without, it gets really kind of sparkly and intense, but I'm taming that down a little bit with the high shelf. And just kind of mellows them out a little bit. Um, okay, I think this is about everything. Um, hopefully this uh, entire series has been helpful. I'd love to do this again sometime. I'll try to um, do this again sometime with uh, maybe some, I don't know how I structure my um, mixed templates or arranging templates or uh, or we'll do another scene a different kind of scene that's not necessarily a chase scene um oh real quick i'll i'll tack this on at the end um for i don't always do this but this was a contest submission and it was up to me to balance everything with the overall audio in the video and so what i did is i saved that for last i i just mixed the track like i normally would um and then i had a separate uh, bus here, a duplicate of the mix bus for the film mix. And I created some volume automation here, as you can see. And most of this is just like, you know, I figured out that negative nine around that was a good sort of baseline for when the action is happening. And I wanted the music to be loud enough. It's a scoring competition. I wanted it to be well heard. Can hear it there it'll cut down overall because obviously i'm reducing volume by negative nine so that's you may have to <laughs> turn this up a little bit but we're hearing it there and then we are um and then we're reducing up here once the voiceover uh once the dialogue kind of kicks in what's happening to him I think he's switching genres. Even for the level of that dialogue, it's still pretty high, because if I take that away, and it's just the same level, you can barely hear what they're saying. What's happening to him? I think he's switching genres. thought that was a little too hot, so I cut that down just to make that a little bit easier. I think he's switching genres. You don't want to bury the dialogue. Um, I don't always do that if I'm doing a, a project. Sometimes I leave that up to the filmmaker. Just kind of depends. But in this instance, I did it. And if I wanted to, I could have uh, adjusted the, the frequency or um, even, you know, created a multiband uh, compressor and kind of have or, or a compressor with a sidechain and uh, do some sidechain compression um, with, uh, you know, audio from the film triggering a compressor in order to make the music kind of fit around the film more. I experimented with that a little bit, didn't feel like it was needed. Um, so there's that. Okay, now we're absolutely done. Uh, thanks so much for watching. If you have any tips for me, any advice on mixing, it's still a skill I'm uh, trying to get better at all the time. So if you saw um, you know, an opportunity for me to use a technique that you thought would have been helpful or something like that. Leave a comment, send me an email, something like that. Let me know. Um, really appreciate some 
some uh, helpful feedback. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully enjoyed the series. I definitely enjoyed making it. Like I said, would love to do more in the future. Um, so yeah, thanks for sticking around and I'll see you later.